you assume when you call a customer service line for a credit card or a bank or insurance, it's your call is answered in the order it's received. But in fact, that's not the case. We all have what's called a CLV or a customer lifetime value. And that's based on, you know, maybe how much our balance is on the credit card or how much we have in the bank or how much the property that's insured is. And that CLV can determine how quickly your call is answered. I'm Essen Zafar, and welcome to another episode of Unfair Nation, the podcast that discusses our nation's rising inequity and social, political, and economic inequality, what it means for you, and what you can do about it. Every other week, we interview one person to get their perspective on structural inequality. And today, I'm joined by Nelson Schwartz, a reporter in New York City. So, almost all of us have to work really, really hard to get into good schools. And we need to have a job or some kind of medical insurance to get medical care. But what happens when you can buy the best medical care? or entrance for your kids into elite universities and colleges. What does that mean for sick patients and students who don't have access to the same resources? And are we being priced out of American social, economic, and public institutions by a velvet rope economy? That's what my guest today is going to answer. His name's Nelson Schwartz. And he is an award-winning economics reporter for the New York Times. And he's also the author of a recent book called The Velvet Rope Economy. Before we get to the interview, though, thank you to our growing number of listeners. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to our podcast. Be sure to leave us a review on Apple's podcast app or your favorite service. All right, let's get started with a conversation with Nelson. Hey, listen. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining. Sure. Appreciate it. You just recently finished uh, writing the Velvet Rope Economy. I've been hearing all about it on NPR. Every time I, uh, every time there's a you know commercial break on NPR, they talk about the Velvet Rope Economy. And as somebody who studies and thinks about inequality, I was like, I have to get first of all, I have to read the book, and then second, I had to get you on the uh, on the podcast. So thanks thanks for joining. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on. So tell me a little bit about uh, why you decided to write the book and and maybe what the Velvet Rope Economy is. Uh, basically, the Velvet Rope Economy, to me, is the system by which everything in consumer life is more and more tiered and stratified and divided by what, you're, what you can pay. And this, this could be nine different lines to board a plane. It could be going to a theme park and going to a concierge doctor and getting a fast track to see a specialist and just the different ways people can jump the line uh, based on what they can spend. And I think what intrigued me about it is once you're aware of it or once it's pointed out, you begin to see it everywhere, even in areas where you didn't really see it years ago, like medicine or high school athletics or uh, even on board ship things have become much more divided and uh, tiered according to class than in the 70s and 80s. And it just seemed to me that it said something larger about the way we were living in society and this sort of the ability of, you know, people with money to jump the line and that it seemed like there was a book there. So I'd like to get into some of these examples you talked about, which are fascinatingly portrayed in your book. I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I was curious, why is it called the velvet rope? Is that is there a historical reason for this? Or is this just from, you know, old timey Hollywood where they used to have these velvet ropes? I mean, where does that come from, that term? I think what I had in mind was the velvet rope that you had in front of uh, a club, a nightclub like Studio 54 in the 70s. And mm-hmm. there'd be a lot of people waiting to get into the club. And then, you know, for a fortunate few, the bouncer would lift the velvet rope and let them in. And that seemed like what was going on, except in this case, the the fortunate few just had money. 
and it raised questions of fairness, and that, that, that was the velvet rope that I had in mind. So there's an element of, based on the example you're talking about, there's an element of people trying to get in. It's not just a, you have something I don't, it's you have something I don't, and I really, really want that something. There's an aspirational element to this. Yes, yes, I think there is, and I think, you know, pe- people do aspire to sort of that special treatment. You know, I think that's part of it beyond the monetary element. Uh, people, you know, want to feel like they're on the inside and they're they're in the select lucky few. And I think it's, as I write in the book, in certain circumstances, it's very seductive uh, when you're, when you can afford to be on the inside and, and the velvet rope parts and makes way for you. Haven't we always had a velvet rope economy? I mean, we've had first class on airplanes, um, and, and other similar environments where some people, if you pay enough, you get better treatment, faster treatment. Uh, you know, I think there are always been elements of this, but what struck me was sort of what changed was kind of the cruise ship metaphor. I mean, 120 years ago on the Titanic, you had, um, you know, different social classes and it was pretty rigid to the point which there were gates between the classes and whether you lived or died uh, after the ship hit the iceberg, depending in part on what class you were in. Uh, so that was pretty severe. But in the sort of post-war era, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, things uh, on board ship became you know, more egalitarian. Obviously, different people had different sized rooms. But outside the room, everyone mixed. There wasn't you know, a ship within a ship like there is now. And you, know, you had you know, people freely moving about the, the, the vessel. And if you watched, I'm dating myself, but if you watched The Love Boat, which was on in the 70s and 80s, you know, everyone mixed on board ship in the dining rooms and the common areas. Now on uh, Norwegian, there's this ship within a ship called The Haven. Uh, on Royal Caribbean, there's Suites class, which is you know, just, and, and they, have, they have different areas just for people in suites. And I think you see this kind of segregation uh, in a way that is, did not exist 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And I think that's, that's what's new. So in your opinion, are we headed back to that Gilded Age uh, of, the, of the kind of Titanic? Yeah, I think if we're not headed back, we may already be there. Um, and, you know, I think in a lot of ways, people don't even come into contact with one another from different classes today. Uh, I mean, that's what's, that's what's scary. And, you know, what's scary is you see this in, in kind of all different kinds of areas. I noticed it back, you know, before the pandemic when you can go to the movies uh, at AMC, at the movie theater, they have this AMC A-list where if you're, you know, you're paying up or you belong to uh, like a frequent flyer group or something like that, you can get your, your popcorn first and you get admitted first. And just things like that, you know, basically, again, it's the segregation where people don't even come into contact with people who are different from them. So give me an example of what that looks like maybe on a, on a cruise line or a cruise ship. I think you talk about it a little bit in your book, but it'd be great for, I think, people to hear what it visually, what it looks like. Sure. You know, on um, Royal Caribbean, you have two restaurants next to one another, Coastal Kitchen and... Um, uh, I'm just trying to remember, and, and Windjammer. And the difference is Windjammer is for everyone, and it sort of has chafing dishes, and it's crowded. Everybody's, you know, kind of congregating around, getting food. And then you have Coastal Kitchen, which has white tablecloths, is calm and quiet. And Coastal Kitchen is only for sweets guests. But what was interesting to me and sort of psychologically notable is to get to Windjammer, you have to pass by Coastal Kitchen. So you see what you can't partake of. I mean, there's frosted glass windows, so you can't really see in. But you pass by, and the cruise ship feels like, you know, I would worry that this would, you know, build up resentment. But they say no, it creates a marker 
and an aspiration. People say, oh, you know, next time I take a cruise, I want to be in the suites class so I can go to Coastal Kitchen. Do you think it builds up resentment? Because, I mean, that's when, when I'm thinking of this. I'm feeling resentful, and I'm not on the cruise ship right now. You know, I, I, there's an element of unfairness to it. Do you think, let's say, let's take their, what they're saying about the cruise ships at face value. Do you think this system nonetheless creates this kind of resentment in other industries? I mean, you talk about this concept of envy, right, um, in the book. Yeah. Um, there, well, there's two, there's sort of, uh, benign envy and malignant envy. Benign envy is the coastal kitchen windjammer situation where you say, Oh, you know, that looks good. I want to do that next time. Malignant envy is where there's real resentment. Um, and the court, you know, the cruise industry is very adept at measuring and studying consumer behaviors and they've done a lot of research. What they found is if you have people in the same restaurant and one group of patrons is being treated differently and getting faster mm. service, that creates malignant envy, uh, whereas wow. separate restaurants does not. Um, so that, that's just sort of their experience. I mean, if you want to see you know, uh, malignant envy at work, you can see it in terms of air rage, uh, you know, on, uh, on airplanes. And, you know, a study found that um, when there's business class in proximity to coach, you have a much higher odds of an uh, air rage incident. Yeah, you, you, you discuss United, the, you know, there was this famous incident several years ago with, with the United Airlines where this, I think, physician was taken off the air or taken out of the airplane. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You, I think you mentioned that, right, in your in your book. Yeah, yeah. I'd say if he had been an elite uh, frequent flyer, he wouldn't have been pulled off the plane. So, I mean, people say, you know, what what does it mean to be have elite status? Uh, they can look you up, uh, and I think that's something. The informational aspect of a lot of this is profound. Um, there's even an app on some airlines where the stewardesses or flight attendants can look at the, at the status of all the different passengers and know who to, you know, go and check and see if they need another cup of coffee. Um, wow. I mean, the amount of information that businesses have, you know, really gives them uh, a leg up in providing special treatment. And uh, I think that guy who got pulled off, he, he, yeah, would never have been pulled off had he had uh, elite status. One of the trends I noticed was between the division between optional spaces and kind of mandatory public spaces mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know the less that wealthy people take advantage of a public space the worse off it gets right because they're not contributing to it and they're creating their own optional spaces you know you, maybe you want to discuss the example of the the which i thought was fascinating was the helicopter story of these mm -hmm, uh, executives mm -hmm. traveling from la to sf using their own personal transportation system? Sure. Um, you know, one thing I've noticed is that as the kind of public spaces have become more difficult, more congested, more, you know, uh, more of a hassle, the elite withdraw and sort of move into their own spaces and where they can bypass that congestion. Um, in New York, you see this with Blade, which is a helicopter service, which you can go from New from you know Manhattan to JFK in 15 minutes, and it'll deposit you right by your plane in a, in a chopper. Normally, that could take two hours in, in rush hour congestion, uh, and they just just bypass it. Um, and I think there's a public policy implication that it's sort of when the elite can sort of bypass these problems there's less of an impulse to deal with it and to address it. Uh, in California, there's a, uh, a private service called Blackbird, which matches people with seats on private aircraft. And what it does is it uses smaller airports like Santa Monica or Palo Alto, as opposed to LAX or, S or San Francisco International, which are very congested. And you'll sort of use these smaller airports, use private planes, and it's more expensive than a budget flight, 
but it's competitive with you know a more expensive regular flight. Mm-hmm. But you you bypass the hassle, and I mean it's it's an intelligent business idea. But again, I just worry what from a public policy standpoint, what does it do when the elite and when people who are campaign contributors and other sort of decision makers and shapers of public policy, when they don't have to deal with the hassles that the rest of us deal with, what is the net result? Is there anything that shows that lack of insight by some of these powerful and wealthy people does result in a deterioration of public spaces? Um, Well, I I just think the fact that you've had, you know, just airports, you know, falling apart and you've had, um, you know, congestion to get to the airport reaching, you know, several hours in, in, in L.A. or New York. Just the fact that that's developed at the same time, you have these services spring up to sort of bypass it, you know, makes me wonder if there's a connection there. There was two stories that really struck me. The first one was the story of you going to Disneyland. and You went, I think, with your daughter to Disneyland and you got the elite treatment. So I'm, I wonder first if you can share that story, you know, what that was like. And then secondly, you know, what impact, if any, you think it had on your daughter and then what that means for, you know, what the velvet rope economy and the growth of this economy means for kids, because I thought that was really interesting for young people. Sure. Uh, Well, I uh, tried out the VIP tour at Disney. uh, On your own dime, huh? Yes. Yes. And um, how much was that? If you don't uh, mind me asking approximately, it's 500 to 700 an hour. Wow. And, um, uh, and it was actually for Disney, unlike Yates, Disney actually comped me. So, uh, I, I didn't actually pay for Disney. Okay. They, they sort of t- treated to me for free, Yeah, but it's 500 to 700 an hour. And, um, uh, it, for a minimum of something like seven or eight hours. So it's, it's quite expensive. But it's really like from another world. I mean, they meet you in a van, and the van, the the tour guide puts stickers on the van to delight my daughters. And you don't wait on a single line. I mean, you go up the back way uh, for these different rides. It's faster than Fast Pass. Just beats up Fast Pass. Fast Pass is nothing compared to this, right? Right, right. I mean, even sometimes the line at Fast Pass was too long, and we we just went right to the front. It was kind of cringeworthy, you know, at times when we walked in front of people. Did they react? I mean, we talked about the cruise ship industry. When you walked in front of people, you felt embarrassed, um, but did right. you see any reactions on their behalf? Uh, I, I mean, I, I saw people looking at us like sort of surprised we were walking in front of them, but I didn't have any... I didn't have any reactions like, what are you doing or anything like that? Cause we had a Disney tour guide taking us. Um, but, uh, it was just sort of bizarre the way, you know, we would use employee only areas in the back, you know, behind the rides and stuff like that to, to cross, uh, one area from another, you know, just sort of save on time. And yeah, I mean, and just to meet, you know, sort of there were long lines to meet the different characters, like to meet Mickey Mouse or Minnie Mouse. And, you know, we would just walk in and next thing you know, my daughter was meeting Mickey Mouse. And uh, at one point, uh, Kelly, our guide, carried my daughter around. Uh, yeah. My daughter at the part. time was, my daughter at the time was about five. And, um, you know, she'd get tired. And so she carried her around just to keep her energy up. I mean, these people will do anything for you. It was almost like Pharaoh <laughs> I mean, in Egypt. That one thing is, is that really got to me, right? That, I mean, it's nice of her, but the fact that she just right. picked up your daughter, you know, having been with kids in a park like this, that, that is a, if I had somebody like that uh, with me, with my nephew around, let's say that would be a lifesaver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, and you know, my daughter, you know, five-year-old's not light. I don't know, maybe 50 pounds, 50, 60 pounds. Right. So, um, um, yeah, it was just pretty incredible. And I was just struck by, like, going up, going up the back way, 
you know, or going, you know, up the side door, like the cast members door, you know, just that kind of thing, you know, is, is crazy. I mean, Disney is interesting because they have a little bit more of an ambivalent relationship about all the privileges and, um, you know, tiering than say universal or six flags. Cause mm-hmm. Walt Disney felt like, you know, class divisions were something that existed outside the park. There shouldn't be this, um, you know, inside the park. So that's why everybody gets a few fast passes. So everybody can oh, jump okay. the line at some point, makes it a little more egalitarian, but the VIP tour is beyond that. And you really can cover a lot more ground with the VIP tour. I mean, just, you know, you don't have to wait at the gate, you know, of the park. And like when you want to go between Magic Kingdom and Epcot and that kind of thing, again, you use the back ways and the ways that the um, uh, cast members use. And it just, it's a whole different experience. And I mean, that's sort of like what being rich in America is like today. I mean, it's a whole different experience. I mean, one of the things that, to to go to this Disneyland example is I think in your book you write it's not easily accessible you can't uh, you can't go on a website and click you know I want the VIP tour here's my eight thousand dollars for the day or whatever thanks very much I mean the access to the velvet rope is obscured I think at Disneyland in some cases and in, in many other like Coachella is another example that you provide where it's kind of the the people that are getting this elite experience, you can kind of see them, you kind of get glimpses at them, but they're really segmented off for the most part in many of these environments. Yeah, yeah. I think Disney, they keep this in the fine print. It's not so obvious. Um, it's, you know, um, it, it, it is sort of segmented off to the side. Uh, it's a real contrast to Six Flags and Universal where it's right on the website and you can get the platinum and skip the line, you know, get the platinum level tickets and skip the line. Um, I think that in Coachella, yeah, it, it's sort of somewhat obscure. Uh, and I think there is a sort of, you know, uh, among the people doing this, there is a desire for privacy or, or maybe a little bit of shame that they're kind of bypassing, you know, that they're jumping the line. What would you just say to somebody who says the velvet rope economy is a natural state of affairs? Big deal. I guess, you know, my thing is, look, I'm not Bernie Sanders. I'm, I'm not calling for socialism uh, in America. But I do think when things get so tiered and so stratified, you have much less of a sense that we're all in it together. Uh, and there's much less of a sense of national unity or, or comedy. And, you know, some of the divisions – we have in our country, I think, you know, even in terms of the candidates that you see connecting with people, whether it's Trump or Sanders, I think anger, you know, really plays into that. And there's a lot of resentment and anger Mm -hmm. in the body politic today. And I think this, you know, accentuates that. And yes, it's always been around to some extent, but when you have nine different groups to board a plane and that, you know, that is on American airlines and the ninth, group which is known to the flight attendants is group nines because they come aboard wow. they're so angry at having wow. waited all that time and they can't find a spot to check their bags in the overhead compartment you know i just think what does that do to our society when, when we don't have a feeling of being in it together and i think you see that with the coronavirus uh, situation where you right. read a lot of stories about wealthy people athletes movie stars able to get tests and ordinary people not being able to get tests. So I think, or, you know, there's a sense that, you know, that we're not all in it together. And I think that really, that's the net result of the velvet rope economy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, speaking of the coronavirus, you know, based on your research, do you think that, I mean, who knows what, what things are like at the present moment where, you know, we're in May recording this, but uh, May, 2020, but do you think that post coronavirus will accelerate this trend towards exclusivity uh, and access, or do you think that we will become more egalitarian as a result of the experience we've had with the coronavirus? I think we might get more uh, sort of uh, more elite and, you know, more uh, bound by class division. Really? Uh, 
Yeah, I, well, at least, I mean, in terms of medicine, I think a lot of people are going to get concierge doctors. Um, I think people yeah. people are going to want that kind of access, and you maybe felt caught short uh, in this situation. The concierge doctor's uh, portion was, for me at least, particularly galling. I mean, the rest of the stuff I can mm-hmm. understand. But when it comes to healthcare, you know, when I was, uh, and I listened to the audiobook, and when I was listening to that, that portion of the book, I was thinking every time one of these physicians, you know, they're very careful as to how they do it ethically based on how you describe it. But every time they kind of cut the line, so to speak, and they call upon the resources of an oncologist, um, there's somebody or maybe even tens of somebody's who are not getting access to that oncologist anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how, How is something like that, uh, how is that allowed? I mean, how, are there no regulations around that? And can you actually, can you explain the concierge doctor concept as well? Sure. I mean, I wrote about very elite concierge doctors who, you know, it could be 50 or $60,000 a year, you know, not, you know, five or 6,000. So sort of, a, sort of the top level. And, you know, a, a regular concierge doctor, maybe you get their cell phone number, and maybe they, you know, you know, call you to check in periodically. This is sort of, you know, much more service oriented relationship. I mean, you get like quarterly uh, reports like you would from your broker. Um, but what, what really counts is that they can get you in with a specialist um, in a matter of days, uh, whereas you might be waiting weeks or months to see a specialist uh, if you didn't have a concierge doctor. And I guess it's based, you know, in terms of it being legal, it's not based on payment. I mean, the concierge doctors aren't getting paid uh, or they're not paying the specialists, but they have relationships and, you know, like everything else, you know, mm-hmm. every, like every other profession, medicine relationships are important and they're able to get you in uh, when you, you know, when you need to be, when you need to see someone. And I think that's very valuable. Um, and, you know, you may have also read in the book about, high-end, you know, college counselors, same kind of thing. Right. I mean, they have this, they have sort of what I call asymmetric information uh, that can be, you know, very helpful, in, you know, just it's a, a limited range of circumstances, but that information is very helpful. That that part really made me feel like um, I almost kind of pitied my younger self. You know, here I am uh, busting my chops, working on a personal statement, my, my, I'm an immigrant, my parents are immigrants, you know, we think we're doing great, uh, you know, and I eventually got into a good school, but, but, uh, then there's somebody else, the way you described it, uh, where they're paying upwards of a hundred thousand dollars to have s- former admissions counselors read and revise, help revise their personal statements. I mean, there's, there's no comparison to somebody who's making a middle income. I mean, they're, they're spending an in t- two times the median income of a family just to get one child, just to get one child a leg up into getting into an elite Ivy League. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, and what I was really struck by was the idea that they were, that this firm, Ivy Wise, hired former Ivy League uh, admissions officers so they would know, this is where the asymmetric information comes into play. They would know what sort of the dean of admissions at Yale sort of might say, oh, the dean of admissions is really into Southeast Asia. We suggest you do a, <laughs> right. you know, a summer uh, trip to Cambodia and write about that for your essay. You know, that, that'll appeal to them. Yeah. Or, or they'll say, oh, you know, the football team, you know, needs uh, a quarterback or soccer team needs a goalie. Just knowing that information is really, really helpful. So at the end of your book, right, uh, you you present kind of this uh, epilogue, kind of this like upward um, positive note kind of chapter. And in that portion of the book, you discuss, I guess, companies and organizations that are still making a profit doing well by their shareholders, but they're also relatively egalitarian. And in fact, you present some examples of companies that are not only making a profit, but they're doing really well, better than their competitors. Can you share some examples of that? I thought that was fascinating, that, that chapter. 
Yeah, yeah. I think the one that jumps out is Southwest, um, the airline. Uh, Southwest does not have classes, um, and it's the most profitable airline in U.S. history. I actually read that it's actually positioned to come out of the COVID uh, situation relatively well, at least mm-hmm. compared to its peers. And it's, you know, it, it's had, it's always had an egalitarian ethos, and they show that you can make plenty of money and do very, very well without being as, you know, ruthlessly tiered as sort of American Airlines say. Um, that was one example. Another one I look at is the Green Bay Packers, which huh. is a fan owned. And, you know, they redid the stadium a few years ago and they kept some of the best seats uh, in the house for ordinary fans. I mean, it didn't all get sort of luxury boxed. And I think they tried to keep a little bit of an egalitarian ethos. I mean, it has blue collar roots in terms of Packers and a, and a packing plant you know, putting up the money for the, you know, first team, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, and I think they try to keep that, that every man quality uh, at the stadium. Whereas like Levi stadium with, with San Francisco 49ers is, is totally honeycombed with different corporate suites and sort of, you know, the sort of the elite of Silicon Valley. So you really see a difference there. Um, and then I look, you know, even in sports that can seem kind of elite, uh, there's room for, again, a more egalitarian experience. Uh, I look mm-hmm. at Band and Dunes, which is a golf course in Oregon, right. and the owner kind of tries to keep the fees reasonable in terms of golfers. So, uh, you, know, it, you know, you have super elite golfing experiences like, the, like Augusta National, you know, the club that hosts the Masters. But... Um, this guy wanted to sort of have a, a really quality golf course that was within reach of ordinary people, and he's doing it, you know, and you, it can be done. Yeah, I guess it just requires a lot more intention behind it and maybe a little bit of a risk. You know, you might have to take a risk, and the risk being that your shareholders may not want that. They may want the easy profits that come from subdividing a plane into 10 different classes, you know. Yeah, yeah. Although Southwest, I mean, they, like I said, uh, I, I just read an analyst note saying they're they're poised to come out of this uh, in a fairly strong position. So right. I mean, they they they've been successful for a, a long time, kind of you know treating everybody equally. Can I ask a very in the weeds kind of question? What if everybody sure. did what Southwest does? It, it, let's say all the airlines did that. It, in other words. Is Southwest only doing well and making a profit because it's an outlier and it's doing something, it's providing a service for a community of flyers that the other airlines are not? And were they to provide be exactly the same, you know, maybe then the airline that would do well would be the only one that was doing classes? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I think if everyone was like Southwest, you'd have an airline come along and do different classes. I mean, for people who could afford it, business class and first is nice. I guess my feeling is you don't have to get rid of business and first. It doesn't have to be that. It's just, can you have a reasonable experience in coach that, you know, or does it have to be a brutal assaultive right. one like we have now? And that's kind of, I guess what you were saying throughout your book, you talk about in the fifties and sixties and even the seventies, you had those kind of velvet rope, environments be smaller both in size and in intensity, right? So you had some of them, but they were just smaller in, in scope and, and also just not as an intense of, a, of an experience, right? Yeah. I mean, I think there was just, um, it was a little less assaultive than at, at the bottom end than it is now. That, that, that I think is the difference. So if you're a, I'll ask this question from, from the perspective of two different kinds of people. First of all, if you're a policymaker, a, a elected representative, um, somebody who has some power over how our economy functions, when, after you read this book, you know, what do you hope that person takes away from your, from your book? And then secondly, you're an ordinary person. You're on the other side of the velvet rope. You know, you, you are the, the person in, in Disneyland who's going through the regular line. What power, if any, do they have over 
creating kind of a more just um, and fair economy or just or fair world? Um, I guess, you know, I would hope that a person in a decision-making context would want to kind of invest in public spaces and would want to create, you know, um, sort of, let's say, schools that were adequately funded that where you didn't have to have pay to play. Like one thing I write about is sort of the fees for sports Mm -hmm. in in public schools. So maybe if schools were better funded, you wouldn't have to rely on that. And then a lot more kids could play. So, I mean, just think of, just have them think about, you know, what happens when people are so segregated and there's less of a sense of that we're all in it together. Uh, I, I say that. And in terms of the person who's enjoying, enjoying this, you know, think about what, you know, what they're missing out on and sort of not having more of a sense of being all in it together. When I went to Yankee stadium, and sat in the elite box. I mean, I noticed people were not that into the game. Everybody right. was looking at their phones. Mm-hmm. You know, there is something lost when you don't have a group experience, you know, all Americans in it together. It's almost dystopian the way you describe that, the, the games, right? And I've, I've been in a box like that once through a friend. And you're right, nobody pays attention to the game. Maybe, you know, right at the end or something. Uh, but, but nobody's really paying any attention at all to the game. It's kind of a networking opportunity. In fact, it probably accelerates the underlying causes or the underlying reasons why people are in that velvet rope box anyway. Yeah, that's what I noticed. I mean, I noticed there, you know, it seems like, you know, in these elite boxes, there's a, there's a kind of, uh, underpowered quality to it. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, you know, there are places that are, have an energy to them, like New York City, when, when we're not suffering from the coronavirus, I think New York City is a place where people of all different classes come together in some areas, like the subway, like Broadway, like other other places, Times Square, and there's an energy to it, and you know that's what it means to be in a republic. You know, republic comes from res publica, public things, and um, and I think when when things are so segregated, that's lost. What's you you know you talk about one example you use is uh, when you call and this applies to so many people I think it's fascinating when I call a uh, my bank for tech support or a billing problem or something if I am a wealthy or you know well um, capitalized bank customer I get without even knowing that this is happening to me I get shunted to the front of the line. Um, And I get better service, right? I might get a better call operator, get, you know, have to not wait in queue on the uh, tech support line. So first of all, it'd be great to hear just a little bit about that story. But then what do you think about the role technology is playing in, you know, moving that rope up even higher, making it even thicker overall in all parts of the economy? Sure. Uh, One thing that I discovered was that, you know, when you assume when you call a customer service line for a credit card or a bank or insurance, it's your call is answered in the order it's received. But in fact, that's not the case. We all have what's called a CLV or a customer lifetime value. And that's based on, you know, maybe how much our balance is on the credit card or how much we have in the bank or how much the property that's insured is. And that CLV can determine how quickly your call is answered. If you have a high CLV, you are shunted right to the front of the line and your answer, call is answered more quickly. It's answered by someone with more training. Wow. And uh, that sort of is an invisible velvet rope, but very noticeable in terms of how you're treated as, as a consumer. And uh, again, uh, you know, I think, that really segregates people and kind of creates a, a kind of a two Americas in terms of service. And uh, whereas if you're not, you know, an elite customer, you really get, you know, second class service. And this just keeps, you know, making the problem worse, right? Cause if you're getting, if you're waiting an hour on the phone line and you're already a middle income person, now you have less time to, you know, uh, prepare prepare for work or schooling or you know contribute to the activities that would move you up maybe economically on the on the 
on the on your pay scale or something like that. You know, get some training or whatever the case may be in the aggregate. If you're wasting time doing these things, yeah, I mean, yeah. All right, well, Nelson, thanks for for joining us. I know you're I know you're pretty busy, so I, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, your book was fantastic. It's uh, I highly highly recommend it. I finished it very quickly. And I, I, I think it's it's really well written, and I think you did a fantastic job, kind of summarizing these issues for a, for a lay audience. You know, I, I learned a lot. Uh, you know, and I and I study these things, and I learned I learned a lot. Oh, great! I really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks again for joining. Stay safe, and you, too. Uh, you know, look forward to reading your next book. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your time. I I really appreciate your interest. Absolutely. Pleasure. Thanks for writing the book. Hey, thanks for listening to another episode of Unfair Nation. You can support us by subscribing to our podcast and leaving a review on your favorite podcast app. Our coverage of coronavirus-related stories continues, and our next guest is going to be Jamie Harrison, He's running for the U.S. Senate seat against Lindsey Graham of South Carolina. We'll be talking to him about why he's running and how issues related to inequality, rights, and community needs factor into his campaign. A special thank you to Nicole Anselmo for her help in co-producing this podcast, Rima Hebrawi for her feedback and advice, and my brother-in-law who somehow manages to snag the phone numbers of all of the important people in the world. As always, thank you so much for listening and stay safe.